So today we're going to look at a sample called vbucks.exe. If we throw that into PE Studio, <coughs> you can see that it's uh, originally written in Visual Studio, and there's quite a few virus detections. So this isn't, you know, anything brand new. It's, it's fairly well detected, and we can look at, uh, you know, any resources in the file, which not really a whole lot going on there. If we go ahead and look at the properties of the file, we see it's fairly large <clears throat> at eight and a half, you know, megs. Uh, that's a pretty big file. So we generally expect to see some sort of packing or um, embedding of other files, um, or you know, just a lot of static imports, things like that. But here we see in PE Bear that <clears throat> there's only three imported DLLs, and not a lot of functionality is coming from them. So. What we tend to see with these types of files when they're this large is that, uh, again, either they have embedded executables or libraries, um, things of that nature, or they were artificially inflated to be larger. Uh, that can be intentional to, uh, if files are large enough, antiviruses won't scan them. And if they're too large, you can't upload them to online sandboxes. But generally, that comes in about the 100 megabytes plus mark. So at 8.5 megs, we're really not reaching that. So another reason files can be large is if they were a Python script and converted into an executable. And if we search the strings in this particular file, we see that uh, it has the Python 3.8 DLL which means it was originally written in Python 3.8 and then converted over to an executable. Specifically, we can search for pytacwin, and that indicates to us that this was a pyinstaller conversion. There's uh, a couple popular tools. One of them is pyinstaller. The other one is pytexe. Those are the two main programs that convert Python scripts to executables. There are others, but those are the two main ones. So. <clears throat> like any conversion, there's other tools out there that you can reverse the conversion process for Pi Installer. There's a specific tool that you can use called Pi. Um, what is it? Um, Pi Extractor. Yeah, Pi Extractor. <clears throat> and it's just a Python script where you give it the executable that was converted to the. Uh, executable and it will go ahead and reverse that out for you. Um, what it does is it'll create a folder for you and extract all the libraries and Python script, uh, binary Python scripts that it found within the executable. That way you can go ahead and inspect them. Of note is that when it finish the, finishes the deconversion, I guess, um, it kind of points out what file, what Python files might be of interest to look at because many of these Python files are going to be standard libraries. And here down at the bottom we can see that uh, there's a manifest called tokengrabber.manifest and that kind of gives us a hint to what the original Python script's name was. So if we go ahead <clears throat> and look at tokengrabber.pyc uh, pyc file is a binary Python file we can run that through um, uncompile6 Uncompile 6 takes binary Python files, so .pyc's, and can, tries to convert them back to original script. Um, as we see here, it has mixed results. Uh, we can see that some of the some of the text on the screen is legitimate Python, and then other parts of it is kind of uncompiled's best guess. So it'll print out uh, an intermediary language of well, this is what these instructions were, but we couldn't really get back to the original source. So for uh, malware analysis, often that's enough. You know, we can get enough clues and things. Uh, like for instance, this we see a, a a link to pastebin, which you know gives us some some kind of checksum, which could be used for some kind of ID that the malware is using. Uh, we also see some references to like Discord billing. Um, in the case of this malware, it is a Discord credential stealing uh, type malware. And it also tries to propagate that way as well. And then down towards the bottom, we also see a Discord webhook API. Uh, this is the malware author's webhook API. 
And what it'll do is the malware will go ahead and steal your credentials, your username, password, any kind of billing information that it was able to find. And it'll use this webhook to go ahead and send that out to their server. So they just get constant updates of, you know, this person was infected, here's all their stuff. Um, I didn't know at the time that webhooks were only <clears throat> uh, writable. So you can only push data. You can't uh, read data from a Discord server. If you could read data, then you could read out exactly what the malware author was receiving. But since we can push data, you could also write a bot to just flood their Discord server with a bunch of false uh, false information, username, passwords, things like that. Um, but yeah, that's how you that's how you analyze uh, initially triage and analyze Python malware. Um, this that's the way you get the kind of convert that executable back to a Python script so you can get kind of legible legible text that way. The only other thing to point out about this sample is that it employs um, a little bit of anti-analysis and it does so in the form of uh, DNS lookups. So what it'll do is go ahead and reach out to those sites that uh, we mentioned previously like Pastebin. Um, there's an IP site that it reaches out to to get your current IP as well as the Discord site. And it every time it looks up one of those sites, it always compares it to localhost and loopback and the name of your computer, uh, presumably looking for you know network monitoring tools that are messing with the DNS to do a local lookup instead of looking up the actual address of the uh, of the website. But that can easily be changed in network monitoring tools. You can have it come back to uh, uh, non-standard loopback and uh, go ahead and bypass that type of, uh, of anti-analysis technique. And here we just use an API monitor to show that um, you know we search for localhost and uh, we got to search up and we see here that you know it does a DNS uh, DNS name compare and it's comparing the the site that it was looking at against localhost and loopback as well as the name of the uh, in this case the VM that we have and again you can get around that just uh, you know your network monitoring tools you just set those up to do a non-standard uh, either loopback address or other network address that you could control and then you can get around that but if you all have any questions about this malware or any other malware uh, go ahead and hit us up at ringzerolabs.com and we'd be happy to help